Cool. So I just got the green light that we're ready to go. Um, so how's it going, guys? My name is Chad Hall. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Remodel Me. We're an online marketplace that does bathroom renovations. Um, and the biggest thing is that we use technology to get rid of the manual associated with uh, doing a home renovation. So typically it takes six months of planning, $34,000 in investment, like 10 people to get you from concept to completion. And with us, we do that with two people and a lot of technology. Um, the I'm, I'm not here to talk about my company. I'm sure there's probably gonna be some questions about my company. I'll weave it into the, the pitch as best that I can. Um, but today I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to convince investors and raise your first million. Um, your first million is not necessarily the, the stopping line. Um, there are a lot of in, a lot of founders who will likely want to raise more money and should raise more money depending on what kind of company they're building. Um, but bigger than anything, I want to share some wisdom that I got from a couple of people who have helped me out in my journey um, and probably share some tips that are non-obvious to black and brown founders. Uh, these are a lot of things that are happening. Uh, sorry, these tips that I'm giving you are happening all over Silicon Valley, uh, mostly white guys um, that dropped out of Stanford are using these, these tips and they're just not known to us. So I figured it'd be good for me to share these things um, because I got these tips by quote unquote being an insider. And I'm hoping that by sharing, it'll make you guys a little bit, it'll make your efforts and raising money a little bit easier if and when you decide to start your own company. Um, so uh, full disclosure, the presentation is an adaptation of an, uh, an essay that I read that was written by Paul Graham. He is part of Y Combinator, um, probably one of the more easy to understand people in venture capital. Uh, so if you hear anything that sounds familiar, it's because I've stolen a lot of his insight and put it into this presentation. Um, but I will go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. Um, again, if you guys have any questions for me alongside the presentation, feel free to drop it in the chat. I got a poll going that I'd love everybody to answer. Uh, but other than that, I want to get jumped in. And I'm going to start with this presentation. So cool. Uh, so the first thing is... Uh, when it comes to investing, uh, excuse me, raising money, the number one thing that you have to do is convince investors uh, that your company is worth investing in. Um, so a lot of people have asked me, you know, how do you do that? And I think that the how to do it is pretty simple, uh, but often overcomplicated. Uh, so I always start whenever I'm talking to a new founder, um, I say, I ask this question, I say, what is the right way to lift? Because I think it's so um, self-explanatory, so obvious, right? Um, that's the poll that I've got going on. Um, and really there's two ways to lift, one with your back or two with your legs. Um, and if anybody has ever lifted anything before, uh, then you know that the right answer is lifting with your legs um, and allowing your legs to do most of the work, not your back, that's how you get hurt. Um, so similarly, um, but not so obvious. The right way to convince investors is not to tell this story uh, that sounds really good but isn't true. Um, it's really just to convince yourself that your company is worth investing in and then tell the truth. Um, when you explain that to your investors, right, make, what I mean by that is don't have your pitch do the, the convincing, um, have your startup do the convincing. If your company is worth investing in, and that will be obvious and people will want to give you money. Um, if you try to make it about your pitch, you know, make it pretty or make it sound really good with all these buzzwords, machine learning, AI, blah, 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 blah. Your pitch is going to sound really good, but won't do enough of the work. You'll end up hurting yourself um, proverbially in the fundraising process. So um, one of the things that I also think needs to be said about venture capital, because it is such a specific um, asset class, is that you need to convince investors that you're going to be one of the big successes. And big successes can be defined in a bunch of ways. Um, y Combinator uh, defines that as a company that can generate $100 million in revenue. Um, but really for most investors, 
uh, I think that the way to think about this is that you're going to be one of 15 companies, and that's the conventional knowledge that 15 companies are going to go on to be worth a billion dollars or more. And in order to be worth a billion dollars or more as a fast growing startup, you have to be at least doing a million dollars in revenue um, in a year. Um, so how do you seem like you're going to be one of the big successes? Um, most investors think of this as binary. You're either going to be one of the big successes like Stripe or Airbnb or Uber, or you're going to be, you know, this nothing of a company that's just too small to return the fund. Um, the really good way to do this uh, comes with three ingredients. The first is being a formidable founder, and that's probably the most important one. The second is working in a promising market. And the third is having early proof. Um, I want to dive into these three things, but I think if you walk away from this presentation with nothing less than these three things, um, then you'd be on the right track. So when we talk about being a formidable founder, um, there's a bunch of ways to do this. Um, I think the simplest way to uh, articulate this point is that you have to seem like you're going to get what you want, right? Um, so get what you want. When I say get what you want is that like when I started remodeling, it, what I wanted was a way for a customer to push a button and get their bathroom renovation done. And if I seem like I'm going to get what I want, right, that typically when I set a goal, it happens, um, then I'll be perceived as formidable. Uh, in other words, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Um, I tend to get my way and then I'll be formidable. Um, the easiest way to do this as a founder is typically to have started a company before and sold it for a lot of money. Uh, but most of us, specifically black and brown founders, don't have that luxury. Um, so there's a couple ways that you can manufacture this. And manufacture doesn't mean to lie because I think that that's a bad idea. Manufacture just means to make it more obvious. Um, one of the ways that I did that at Remodelmate is that I explained uh, that I come from an athletic background. Uh, the first time that I ever ran track, I did a 400 in about 90 seconds. And for anybody who uh, understands what a 400 is, it's one lap around the track. Um, you'll understand that 90 seconds is incredibly slow. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the, for, for context, the world record is a 44 seconds set by uh, Michael Johnson ooh, almost 20 years ago, right? So 90 seconds, there are a lot of people who just said like, you should go ahead and never run track. Like this is just not your sport. Um, what eventually happened though, is not only did I become one of the leaders on my team um, in high school, but I also participated in track and field at the collegiate level. And I ran for the Terps, a D1 team. Um, and before I uh, retired, I had hit the Olympic B standard in the men's decathlon. Um, objectively the hardest event in all of the uh, track and field events because uh, you have to be good at sprints, long distance throws and jumps. Um, in that order, it would be the 100, 400, 110 hurdles in the mile, high jump, long jump, pole vault, javelin, discus, and uh, shot put. Uh, so uh, a lot of times I, I tried to just explain that the reason why I'm formidable is the first time that I ran track, um, everybody said that I shouldn't do it, that I was a, you know, a loser. This wasn't my event. Um, and by the time that story was done, 12 years later, uh, I was objectively one of the best in the world at that event. I never went to the Olympics, but I did hit the B standard, something that a lot of people will never do in their life. So um, just from telling that story, like, hey, Chad, tell me about yourself. Hey, uh, from New York, I went to Maryland. I was on a track scholarship. What's really cool about that is uh, the first time I ran track, people said, you probably shouldn't do this. This isn't your event. Um, you should probably pick up basketball or football, you know, something else, because this is not what it is, right? So I start my story with that. Um, one, because it's a short story, but two, it just shows that like over 10 or 12 years, the time that it takes to build a startup into possibly a very big company, it takes 10 or 12 years. Um, I went from being relatively unknown and uh, the, the, the longest bet to objectively being one of the most competitive. Um, and that's what investors are looking for. Um, I think what's really important, this kind of speaks to my very first point, was stick to the truth, right? You don't have to say like, oh yeah, I've started a trillion companies and you know I'm so smart and I'm so this and I'm so that. 
Uh, you really should just be talking. Uh, you, you should convince yourself that your idea um, and your company is worth investing in, and then just tell that story to investors. Um, the biggest reason why you should stick to the truth is that it makes you come off more confident. Uh, you tell me that like one plus one is two, and I said, no, 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 no way. You probably look at me like I was crazy. Um, and that skepticism is good because if you are saying something about your company that you know to be true and the investor is skeptical, then you're going to be able to not necessarily fight back, but explain to them, they're like, hey, you're mistaken. Um, and it'll make you seem so much more confident. You'll be a domain expert um, and you'll be able to have your startup do the work, not your pitch do the work. Um, the reason why it's very important for you to stick to the truth is because investors are way better at detecting bullshit than you are at producing it. Um, to give you some context, like the first time that I raised money, I went and I pitched, I don't know, maybe 60 investors. Um, and while it was the first time that I was ever pitching, this is probably like the 600th time that they've heard a pitch this week. Um, so much better for you to stick to the truth. Um, instead of creating bullshit, because a lot of investors are going to see through it and understand that this guy's not really, or this girl is not really onto something. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't have to make up this story. They would have a really good uh, company, um, and the company would be so compelling that when you hear about it, you'd want to invest in it. Um, I want to pause here for a second before I move into the next session, uh, next section, excuse me, and just see if there are any questions from the session going on. Um, if not, then we'll jump right back in. Um, cool. So it looks like a couple more people have joined in and a couple more people. Great. Um, so no questions. So I'm going to keep on rolling. Um, so the next part is uh, having a promising market. I think one of the most interesting things about having a promising market is that as a first time founder, I thought that I had to convince investors, and again, this is about like making the pitch work instead of just making the company do the work, which is definitely easier. I thought in my pitch, I had to prove to them uh, or convince them that I was going to succeed, right? That this was uh, a big fragmented market where there isn't any big winner, and I'm definitely going to win. Um, that's not actually the case. Um, you really just have to prove that you're a sufficiently good bet. And I think that framing is important because um, you'll, you'll hear about like, you know, our white guys uh, dropped out of Harvard or dropped out of Stanford. Um, they're, they never pitch as if like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to put Google out of business because blah, 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 blah. That's pretty hard to believe when you think of like the size and reach of Google. And then you really need to have a, a super sturdy plan. And you almost can't be wrong um, in any of your execution. Like all of your, your, your data and your traction has to back that up. But if you approach it as if like, yo, I'm just a significantly good bet uh, or a sufficiently good bet, it's significantly easy for your company to just point to good signals that that is probably going to be true. Um, so what does sufficiently good bet mean? Um, for me and for most investors, um, that's going to mean that you need to have a plausible plan on how you are going to own a big piece of a big market. Um, big markets are those, when you're talking about venture capitalists, big markets are defined as those that are greater than $1 billion and still growing. Um, big piece, that's a little subjective. Um, some markets could be, you know, a trillion dollar market so a big piece could be one percent because you'd still get you know your hundred million dollars in revenue billion dollar valuation and be able to return a lot of capital for your investors um, other markets are smaller right if you have a ten billion dollar market um, then you probably need to own you know somewhere around ten percent um, or at least your plan has to be to own ten percent because you might be wrong but if you fall from the ten percent plan you'll still be a hundred million dollar revenue company billion dollar valuation company that can go public or be acquired by someone else. Um, I think that the, the, the operative word here is plausible plan. Um, and I think this is another place where we get jammed up, we being black and brown founders. Plausible just needs to be believable. 
Again, it needs to be a sufficiently good bet, not a short thing. So um, I like playing poker, and I think I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about plausible plans a little bit later. But the big thing that I want you guys to focus in on is that it doesn't have to be perfect. It needs to be believable. Um, the way that I like to get to market size and also help me describe or uh, think about my plausible plan is to really think about how customers are doing this today. So when we looked at Remodel Nate, uh, the first time that I raised money, I went and I looked at how many customers are paying so many dollars a year. Uh, most people are going to do what is considered top-down analysis, right? Uh, so if you're like me and you're a little bit lazy, you go to Google and you say, how big is the home improvement market in the United States? And you'll find out that that number is something like 450 billion a year, right? But if you tell an investor that like, yeah, um, 450 billion dollars is spent annually in the United States on home improvements, and I'm gonna own 10% of the company, 10% uh, of the market in 10 years, they're gonna say, that's what everybody else says. You have no plan, right? It's much better for you to say, hey, there are 21,000, uh, or excuse me, there are 10,000 uh, homeowners in the District of Columbia who pay $21,000 a year to renovate their bathroom. The market is now much smaller than 450 billion. It's only 210 million. Um, but it shows a couple of things. One, that I have an initial thesis about where I'm going to launch the company. Two, I understand exactly how much customers are paying today. And then, it also might open up um, a conversation about how they make decisions about where to spend that $21,000 or where they find customers today. So just by having this number down tight, right? 10,000 homeowners a year pay $21,000, or excuse me, 10,000 homeowners um, pay $21,000 a year um, to renovate their bathrooms, making this a $210 million market. Um, and by the way, what I've learned about these customers is they're typically young, um, just moved into a house, and they moved into their house after some life event happened. So they recently got engaged, uh, they just got married, they're expecting a child, then they bought their house, and then that house needed some renovations. So now, not only do I know how many people there are, how much they're willing to spend, but exactly how to get in contact with them. Um, so then that then becomes a story about how I plan to get those customers, right? So instead of spending tons of money on Facebook and Google um, saying, hey, come try my product, I would go and find out places where um, people who are engaged spend a lot of their time, people who are married spend a lot of their time, people who are expecting a child spend a lot of their time. And I would find that there are these little pockets of communities that were happening in real life or on the internet where they were already talking about this shit and all I had to do was interject into the conversation and let them know that I could solve their problem. Um, the really cool thing about doing bottoms up analysis, especially if you're a marketplace like me and only starting with one market, it's you don't really have to be right about the $450 billion number. You just have to get this small number right. If you can get 10,000, if you know there are 10,000 customers who are paying 21,000 a year, that's $210 million. And there's only, DC is only, um, you know, probably in the top 25 as it pertains to big cities, then it's very easy for you to say, okay, cool. Are there five other markets like this where there's 10,000 people spending 20 grand a year? Because if so, that's already a billion dollar market. And if I'm really good at finding customers here in DC, then I at least can do it in four other places, get them in my billion dollar market. And then I just need to capture you know, 10% of that in revenue to be a billion dollar company. Um, now let's say that I was really, really good, right? And I could do this in 50 other markets. Oh, well, then we're a $10 billion company. Um, well, what if I could do this in uh, 50 other markets, uh, but it's not just bathrooms, it's kitchens. And to keep the numbers easy, right? Let's just say that by adding kitchens, I've doubled the size of my market. Well, now I'm at 20 billion and I'm still only at 10%. I haven't yet like completely owned the market, right? Like I read somewhere the other day that um, 
Google is responsible for something like 90% of search volume on the internet. So I'm not even 90% of the market, I'm already a big enough company. So I think this is another thing that um, specifically black and brown founders overcomplicate. When it comes to your product, whatever it is, you could be selling shoes, you could be selling um, sneakers, you could be doing a tech product, whatever. Um, you really need to understand who your customers are, how much they're willing to pay, and then how you plan to get them to use you instead of your competitors. The next thing is early proof is the easiest way to back up your story. Um, so it's one thing for you to have a promising market. Um, it's another thing for you to be formidable because you can articulate this. Uh, but if you have early proof, um, that will be the easiest way for you to raise money re relatively easily. Um, early proof does depend on how old your company is. And the reason it does is because if you're like a three month old company, when you're raising money, you're, you're really gonna be saying, hey, I, I wanna run this experiment on how to capture customers. Um, and it, the, the, the way that investors will be you know, deciding that you're a sufficiently good bet is, hmm, do I think Chad can accomplish the thing that he's trying to accomplish with the money that he's asking for? Um, if you're a two-year-old company, um, which is where I am, um, and you're raising you know, significantly more cash, instead of a million, maybe you're raising 10 million, um, it's not as simple as being able to say, I'm a sufficiently good bet, um, and I want to run an experiment, you have to prove that your last experiment went well. And that will, again, show that you are a formidable founder and that your market is promising because your last experiment went well. So the odds of your next experiment going well go up. It's still not a sure thing. And that works in both of our favor, uh, our favor meaning founders, because now it forces the investor to be a little speculative and they don't want to miss out on the deal. Um, but it's also good for investors because if I knew that this was a good thing, they wouldn't be able to invest in my company, you know, $10 million into my company for a, at a 40 or $50 million valuation where I'm selling 25 to 20% of my company. If I knew it was going to be a short thing, then the cost or the value of the company would already be in the hundreds of millions or billions and $10 million wouldn't get them very much. Um, but I do want to show, um, I, I do want to lean into early proof being the best way for you to uh, kind of close the loop on being formidable and having a promising market. So if you start out with a company um, that, you know, you sound good and the market sounds good, but you have no proof, it's going to be a lot harder for investors to get behind this idea that you're on the right path. Um, another caveat is that early proof really is company specific. If you're a social media site where it's absolutely free for you to use, um, then your early proof is gonna be user growth, right? If you're a company um, that literally is about making connections, but you can't figure out how to get people to connect on your site, meaning your user growth isn't through the roof, probably gonna be um, an early sign that this isn't the right product. Um, if you're a marketplace like me, early proof is gonna be a function of how many users do you have on both sides? of the platform, but more importantly, are they doing transactions? So um, for me, I probably only needed like 10 contractors and like 100 customers, uh, 100 homeowners to be doing business with each other. Um, and that could be $100,000 in sales, it could be a million dollars in sales. But what the proof was, is are they using my site to do business with each other? Compared to a company like Facebook, they probably need like a million users, no money, no revenue yet, because uh, in order for them to get um, advertising advertisers to spend with them, they need to have a lot of people already on the site. Um, so early proof is going to be different with every company, but early proof does help. Um, I'm going to stop here again just to see if there are any questions and check in with uh, the team. Uh, but uh, look, okay, cool. So there are some questions. So. Nice. Um, Femi said, how do you choose or know the right person to pitch to? Um, and then, Dame, it looks like there's a big difference. 
Um, which podcast blogs, conferences, LinkedIn groups, books do you recommend? Um, so podcast blogs, conferences, LinkedIn groups, books do you recommend? That's a very long answer that I can get to. Um, Femi, I'll answer your question. Dame, I'm not going to forget about you. I just don't want to get uh, hung up just in case we run out of time. Um, so, so Femi, for your question, how do you choose or know the right person to pitch to? Um, there isn't really a good answer for this. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my uh, example. Um, so for me, I looked at first stage. So uh, if in my first round, I only raised half a million bucks. So I wanted to look at investors who are going to be comfortable writing checks between $100,000 and two fifty, dollars right? Um, an investor whose smallest check is about a million dollars wasn't going to be interested in my funding round. It had nothing to do with my company or my business or anything else, but they just want to put a lot more capital to work than I needed um, or that I thought I needed. Um, so stage um, and check size. So whenever I meet with an investor, I ask them three things. Are you currently investing? Uh, that's a very interesting question um, because not just because you're an investor doesn't mean that you're writing checks. The second thing is, what's your average check size? So 200, 250, half a million, 2 million, whatever. And then what's your process? Um, for me, I, I had a bias to work with uh, investors who like to work quickly, so 30 to 60 days. If you're the type of investor who wanted to get to know me for a year, I would say, okay, we can start having a conversation, but for this round, I kind of moved them into another bucket. Um, the, so, so that's stage. Um, and by the way, the, like the, those three questions, you can either find out online because they'll talk about it on their websites, or you can go to Angelus, which Angelus or Crunchbase. Those are places where I would do most of my research. So Dane, that sounds like that was your second question. Like, how do you find out their investment history? So I would go to Angelus or Crunchbase and say, um, yeah, you know, did they invest in Uber's? Um, seed round or did they invest in their series B? Are they invested in their series B? Probably not the right person, um, right fund, not yet. Um, but if they were in their seed round and they put in like a quarter million dollars, probably someone I'd want to talk to. So the second thing is like, you know, what kind of companies do they like to invest in? Uh, people who invested in Uber or Airbnb or Postmates or DoorDash, those are investors that I wanted to pitch because they like marketplaces. Um, or at least that was my uh, belief, right? Um, companies or, or f uh, funds that invested in like Tesla, probably not the right fit for me. Uh, what they're signaling is that they like hardware um, and they like manufacturing and maybe auto mo automotive spaces, um, all of which I wasn't. Um, so it's not that they couldn't be an investor, but the odds of them being an investor probably low. Um, and again, right, I'm trying to maximize my odds that I would be perceived as a good bet. Um, so if I'm formidable, if I have a good market and I have some early proof, but you just don't like home improvement or real estate or marketplaces, um, those you're, you're not going to be interested in my company, not because I don't have a good company, but because that's just not the space that you're in. Um, so I hope that answers that question. How do you choose the right person to pitch to? Um, and then how do you find that in their investment history? Uh, Mateo has a question. says, let's say you're designing futuristic technologies. What would you say that early proof would look like? Um, so give me a little bit more. Um, give me a little bit more context on what you mean by futuristic technologies. And let's assume that your technology does work the way it's supposed to, who would you sell it to? Mateo, while you're working on that answer, I'm going to circle back around to uh, Dane. Um, and you asked about podcasts, blogs, conferences, LinkedIn groups, books. Um, so books, I have a bunch that I can share with you guys. Uh, I will probably uh, share that with the tech summit, text giving summit, uh, organizer. So they can just send it out to everybody. Um, for, uh, LinkedIn groups, I'm not on LinkedIn groups, uh, conferences, 
I'm partial to South by Southwest just because it's a good time, but not necessarily because I, I get too much from it. Um, as far as blogs and podcasts, blogs, I follow everything um, that Y Combinator writes. Um, I think that they're just very matter of fact and they don't use a lot of like smoke and mirrors language. Um, so I love them for that reason. reason. Um, and then all of the partners at YC also have their own blogs that I typically follow. Uh, for podcasts, Masters of Scale is definitely my favorite. It's uh, by Reed Hoffman. He's the founder of LinkedIn, um, also a venture capitalist, and was at the Teams at uh, PayPal and eBay, I believe. Um, so those would be my answers. Um, Dan, you got a, follow a couple more follow-up questions. Do you have the company? Do you have to have a company created and incorporated already? Um, created? Um, and incorporated when you're pitching, maybe not. Um, but before you get a check, yes, you'll definitely need to be incorporated. Um, you know, business bank account, that kind of thing. Uh, networks and mentors, not sure what you mean by that question. Um, but we can get back to that. Again, I want to watch time. So I'm going to jump back into screen sharing. And I'll come back to questions in a second. So, um, Depends on how old your company is. There's a question about traction for that specific company. Um, if it comes back up in the chat, then I will make sure to revisit. Um, the, uh, the last thing that I want to touch on is that um, rejection, right? Even when you're formidable, even when the market is promising, even when you have early proof, you're going to get way more no's. Uh, then you get yeses. It's just a part of the game. So um, I, I think that everybody who's going out to raise money should just get comfortable with that idea. Um, bigger than anything, I, I, I want to explain something that happens worse, uh, something that happens that's worse than rejection. Um, a lot of times I would get pit, I would pitch and then I get the question like, who else is investing? And at the time, uh, nobody was invested. Nobody had invested yet. Um, some people had passed. Some people were still thinking about it. And you know, I thought that this was really a stupid question because, like, well, either you think it's a good idea and you want to invest, or you don't. Um, why does it matter um, that you know, insert investor here is invested? Um, I want to give you guys a little bit more context. The reason why it matters is because and you kind of think of this like college. Uh, if you can get into Harvard, then the odds of you getting into like your local community college are also astronomically high. Um, but the inverse is not true. If you can get into your local um, community college, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to get into Harvard. This is not the way it works. So a lot of times investors will look for signals that you're already formidable, have a promising market and early proof. So Sequoia or first round or one of these other like um, household name VC funds has invested, then they'll kind of do a shortcut. Um, but if they can't, if they, if you don't have one of those commitments yet, uh, that might give them a reason to pass or um, you know, give them a reason to like twiddle their thumbs a little bit. Um, and there's this thing that happens, right? So for me, what I would start to say is like, oh yeah, so I'm talking to this fund and this fund and that fund, and they're really close to making a decision. Um, they're gonna invest, um, which is not necessarily a lie, but it's not the truth either. Um, and this kind of goes back to you know, my previous point, which is stick to the truth. Um, I, I noticed that I got significantly better at raising money um, when, I would just be open and honest about the investors that I talked to that past and the investors that I'm talking to that are still considering making investment but haven't committed yet. Um, when I spoke about investors that I talked to but they passed, uh, I always made a really big point to explain why that investor was wrong about passing. Um, so I would say, you know, hey, I spoke to first round. Um, you know, Josh thinks that the, the home improvement marketplace space is crowded. Um, and Angela's and Home Advisor are already the winners. 
And then I would explain to this new investor that like, you know, Josh has been in the game for a while. Um, he's got plenty of great investments and exits under his belt, but he's wrong about this space for this reason. And I would explain that like in a $450 billion industry, Amgesus only generates 450, uh, excuse me, hundred million dollars in revenue a year. Uh, so, and their, their market cap is somewhere around 400 million. So in a market where there's $450 billion of money transferring hands every year, this company, Angelus, who's quote unquote the winner, doesn't even yet have the lion's share of the market, right? It's less than 1%. So um, I, I would just make that point and then I'd move on. And then you'd be like, oh yeah, so I believe, either they, they like me and they believe that, so then they would start asking other questions. Um, and it'd become a yes and conversation. So, okay, Chad, you think that you're going to go after bathrooms and you're going to do this better than, um, you know, any other company, Angie's List, whoever, right? Um, I think that you should also think about kitchens because I think you're on the right path with bathrooms. And what about kitchens? If you nail being formidable, you'll almost always hear investors talk about new ideas. They'll get really excited and they want to daydream with you about what the future might happen, or what the future might hold. Um, if you haven't yet nailed formidab formidability, then they'll start talking about the negative things like, well, yes, that might be true that Angesus hasn't figured it out, right? But if they haven't figured it out after 20 years, then how the hell are you going to figure it out? Um, the biggest point is that it happens and it's not really worth you like losing sleep over it. Move on um, and just try and figure out how you could become a little bit more formidable in your next pitch. Because the market size likely won't change. You're never going to be right about market size. Um, and your early proof is your early proof. You can't really move the needle on that. Um, you know, leaps and bounds in a fundraising process that usually takes a month or two. Uh, but you can consistently work on being more formidable, which should make number two and number three a little bit easier. The last thing uh, to close out is that I want everybody's idea to change about how they look at investors. Um, investors think of companies as bets, um, and their job is really to make the most inf uh, intelligent bet with as much information as possible and only commit uh, as, as late as possible. So what I mean by this, um, hopefully we have some poker players in the, in the market, or excuse me, in the audience, that will understand um, this analogy. So um, for those of you that don't know, uh, the when you're playing Texas Hold'em, um, you're dealt two cards. Um, everybody does a round of betting. Um, and then there's going to be three cards that come out on the flop. Um, then you can do another round of betting. Then one more card will come out. That's called the turn. There'll be another round of betting. Then there's one more on the river then another round of betting and then you show your cards. Um, when you're dealt two cards, it's called your pocket pair, the absolute worst hand that you could get is a two seven, specifically if they're not of the same suit. The reason why two seven is the worst hand is because there's no face cards. They're not of the same suit, so a flush is out of the way, uh, is out of the question. And then um, the, the last part is uh, there, there's an opportunity for a straight because you have what's called uh, the bookends. So in order to fill the middle, you would need a three, four, five, and a six. Uh, so it's very, very hard for you to get four cards that you need because there's only going to be five dealt on the board. On the other side of that, the absolute best hand that you could get is pocket aces. Uh, aces are the strongest uh, card in the deck. Um, and it's typically... Uh, a lot of hands of poker are one with just having one or two pairs. You don't always need to have a, a flush or a straight or you know, a full house. You could definitely win a hand uh, with just a pair. So if you're dealt a pair of aces, um, your odds of winning are significantly higher at the outset, let alone when the other hands come out onto the board. So I like to use this analogy because if you can do – um, there are a lot of things that you can do to seem like you are more of pocket aces than a two seven. And whatever that might be for your company, that should be your goal. 
because you don't have to be right. And what I mean by this is just because you have pocket aces doesn't mean that you're not going to get beat. Someone still could have, you know, a pair of sixes and then on the flop, right, there's, I don't know. I'm sorry, that's a bad example. A person could have a six and a seven of the same suit. And on the flop, they get, you know, five, four, three, whether it's the same suit or not. If it's the same suit, then they've got a straight flush. If it's not the same suit, they've got a straight. But let's say that you get like a jack and a 10 of the same suit. Uh, then you could also get a flush there. There are a bunch of things that can beat a pair of twos, uh, excuse me, a pair of aces. So just because the pair of aces at the, out, at the onset makes you the best bet, the best hand, doesn't mean that it's guaranteed that you're going to win. Um, so I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that since investors are looking at this as bets, you don't need to be a pocket pair, uh, excuse me, a pocket ace um, to raise money. Um, but it is extremely harder for you to raise money if you're a 2-7 off suit. Um, there are plenty of J10s, um, you know, 8-9 on the same suit um, that get funded. It's all about making sure that you know what you have to do to make your hand look like a compelling bet. And your hand is the summary of being a formidable founder, working in a sufficiently large market, and then having some early proof that your strategy is the winning strategy. If all else fails, the easiest way to raise money is to make something that's worth investing in. So again, something that uh, needs to belong in the world. Understand why it's worth investing in. So um, for me, that was... If all things considered equal, if you could get your bathroom renovated for 13 grand in three weeks, that would be um, more compelling than paying $34,000 and taking six months. So once I understood that and how I was going to tell that to customers, uh, all I had to do was explain that to investors. And the ones that did, that agreed with me, um, invested in the company. And the ones that didn't, didn't invest in the company. Um, what helped me stay on track was that I never deviated from my story. Um, uh, so that made me appear to be formidable. Um, the, the market was promising and I had some early proof that signaled that I was on the right path. Um, uh, if you can't do those three things, just make something that's worth investing, understand why it's worth investing in, and then explain that clearly to your investors. That's the end of my, uh, session um so really it's just going to be q a from the time being and um i want to open up the session to some more questions um so i'm going back to mateo so it says depends on the product i would produce maybe some prosthetics for the military new advancements to the car market okay so uh, Mateo, your original question was, uh, let's say you're designing some futuristic technology. What would you say early proof would look like? Um, so if it's prosthetics for the military, I think the best early proof would be like a, a letter of intent for some part of the, some branch of the military that says, hey, I want to use this product. If you build it, like I will order a hundred, right? If, if you can get this prosthetic arm that is going to be able to move and, you know, flex and whatever, whatever, because of your use of AI and cloud brain engineer, whatever, right? I think that the best early proof, because that is going to be expensive to build and you actually need money to bring that to market. The, the early proof is either going to be a small scale prototype that you've been able to build with limited funds or a letter of intent from a customer that would want to buy this thing. Um, new advancements to the car market. Again, kind of same thing. It needs to be an early prototype um, with it working. Uh, so that would be, I don't know, maybe you only have one car, um, but it can drive autonomously, right? So the reason why you're raising $100 million is because in order for you to manufacture these and make them mass market, 
it takes a factory and employees and machinery and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but for super, well, in, in the investment community, those are called moonshots. They're really, the, the early proof is not customers because you, you don't have all the things that you need to be able to sell it. Uh, you just have to show that you can make the thing that you are, that you plan to sell. Um, that would be my answer for your question. Um, I'm uh, happy that you guys like enjoyed the, the poker metaphor. Uh, metaphor, um, And then, uh, let's see. Femi, do I have plans to get acquired? Um, so I actually think that we're going to be a public company if we're right. Um, I would not be against uh, getting acquired. You know, it, it all depends on what the, you know, who's writing that check. Um, but my thought is that bathroom, getting a bathroom renovation sucks in the United States. It also sucks in Canada. It also sucks in Mexico and Europe um, and all the other developed parts of the world. So um, I really think that we would be uh, what's called an enduring company, one that goes public and helps people all across the world. Um, today it's just bathrooms, tomorrow it'd be kitchens, then we'd be finishing basements and floors and everything else. Um, so acquired, maybe, um, but right now the plan is to go public. Um, Dane, uh, biggest challenge. Um, the biggest challenge would probably be around not knowing what to build. So my original thesis was that I was going to build uh, like a billing app. So it was going to be a SaaS thing where I did customers on one side, contractors on the other side, and contractors paid me to get access to the SaaS tool that made billing a little bit easier. Um, that still exists today in Remodelmate. So when a homeowner books a contractor, the homeowner pays us um, and then we pay the contractor. So it keeps the transaction level. Uh, but contractors don't pay for that. We just get a percentage of the deal. Um, so the, the biggest challenge, uh, that wasn't actually the biggest challenge, like figuring that thing out. But um, I, I say that the biggest challenge overall is that anytime that I've had an idea, I thought that it sounded really cool and it was like, oh, okay, this is going to work. Um, but then I would talk to my customers, whether that be homeowners or contractors, and either learn that like that wasn't really a problem that they were willing to pay for, or that was a cool idea, um, but my real pain is this. Um, the way that I solved that was just always staying really close to customers. Um, if you look up like our reviews online, you'll see a lot of our, our customers saying like, what I really love about Remodelmate is that, um, you know, I signed up under this pretense and then when I figured it out, like as a customer, I didn't like this part of the product. And then I said, hey, um, I don't like this thing. And then, you know, a month later, like that thing was fixed. Um, so yeah, uh, stay close to your customers because that's probably going to be the hardest thing. Once you get to, I don't know, probably a year or two in, you'll probably have something that people really love. And then by then, um, it's just figuring out how to get more and more people. Uh, but in the first like year or two, the hardest part is not knowing exactly what to build. Um, so you got to stay close to your users. Um, and then personal funds. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I worked at Living Social. I got laid off uh, like the third round of layoffs and I got eight grand. And uh, instead of like sitting at home and getting fat uh, while I looked for my next job, like I took my severance to start the company. Um, any other questions before I go ahead and wrap it up? Um, I really appreciate everybody um, jumping in and asking questions and staying around for the presentation. Uh, I want to make sure that I get to any other questions if there are any. And if there aren't, I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Um, my email is just chat at remodelmate.com. Um, so, if anybody wants to jump in or shoot me a note, uh, I'm more than happy to connect you guys offline. Cool. Thanks for having me.
Take care.